commit, generally, it will not look at your working directory. It completely get commit, completely ignores your working directory. It does not care what's in your, you can remove all the files in your working directory. It doesn't give a shit, right? It just doesn't care. What it looks at is your index. So once you put this in your index, and when you, when you run git commit, it will re record that. Right now, since we've just modified the file, if we run git commit, it will do nothing at all, right? So this is really confusing to some people sometimes because it's, it's looking at your index and you haven't modified your index yet. So. You have to stage changes, and then you can optionally review your changes. The way you stage changes is with git add. So git add tracks content, but it also stages changes. And the reason why it's called git add is because it's a slightly different usage of add. It's not adding the file to your repository or to your project. It's not saying, start tracking this file, add it to my project. It's saying, add it to my staging area, right? Add it to my index. Add it to the area that I'm going to use to record my next snapshot. Add it to my next snapshot. That, that's what add means. So it takes content in your work directory, puts it in your index, adds it to your index. Right? Now, so if I do that, then it will snapshot it, and it will put it into your index. And then if you run get status again, you'll see that that file has been modified. And that it's staged, because it's, it's green, and it's under uh, changes that are, that are staged. So if I run. If I modify a file again, so I go in here, I change a version, and I run get status, I'll see the version change in change but not updated, and the main.py, the comment in change to be committed. If I run git commit right now, only the change in main.py goes in, not the change in app.yaml. Right? Does that make sense? It's really, I'm, it's really simple. Now, what, when it gets interesting is if we go back in and modify main.py again, right? So if I go in here and I have that comment and I internationalize it, uh, and I say get status, now we'll see this, right? We see main.py is staged, app.yaml and main.py are unstaged. So main.py is actually in both, right? And this is not because it's a Python program. The reason why it's like this is because when you run git add, it says the version of the file as it exists on disk right now, that's what I want to go into my next snapshot. If you modify it again, git commit is not going to look in your working directory. It's not going to care that it's changed from what you ran git add on. It's going to remember what you ran git add on. Because that's what snapshots it and puts it in your database and, set, and puts it in your index and says, that's what's going into my next snapshot. Right? So you can have different versions on disk and what's in your index. So that's, that's the, the version that will be in your snapshot if you run git commit and that will be shared with people, not the one that's in your working directory. So you have to stage your file after you edit it. Um, OK, so if we restage these files and we run git status, everything's peachy keen, and we can run uh, git commit. And so git commit will take whatever's in our index and record that snapshot for our friends and family. Um, and that just uh, permanently puts that state of the index and all of the contents as of the last time you ran git add on them in your repository, and it's almost impossible to get them back out again. So once you run git commit, you don't really have to worry about losing any of that data, anything that you've committed, right? It's very difficult to, to lose it at that point, no matter, no matter what you run. Um, there's, there's no git command that will remove the data. So uh, rm-rf.git will, but basically nothing else. Um, OK, so git commit. So when you run git commit, it will open up an editor and say, what message do you want? You can use dash m like I did, but that's fairly bad practice. How many of you are open source developers? Okay. How many of you are maintain an open source project of, of any size? Okay, that's that's pretty good. The rest of you should. Um, okay, so when you're committing to an open source project, a lot of them will have rules of this sort, but it's good in general if you're using Git because it is easier to craft a series of commits. It's not like Subversion where every time you run commit, it goes to the server immediately, right? You can take some time and make a nice commit series that, where each commit is a logically separate change set. And that's, that's the rule of thumb for um, the Git project, the, the Linux kernel project and stuff, is that every commit should be a logically separate change set. And if you have some huge feature that touches a lot of different areas, you do all of them as some series, like a patch series, right? Here's six commits that in the end, you end up with the snapshot that has the feature in it. But the history leading up to it leads you to understand how it gets to that point, what all it has to do. Each one could be cherry-picked or peer-reviewed individually. So 
what tends to happen is, is you do a series of logically separate change sets as commits, and then each commit message has, this is what this one logically separate change set is, right? Um, so what you tend to want to do is you want to do one line of about 50 characters, and then a blank line, and then a paragraph saying why you're changing it. Why, why it needs to be changed, what is being touched, what the possible ramifications are, etc. cetera. Um, so you want to do this rather than dash in. Um, but that's, that's what, what you do. So don't do that, but do something actually helpful. OK, and an empty commit message will abort the commit if you want to get out of it it's, uh, for some reason. You forgot. It puts the status output in there. Everything with a hash in front of it is stripped out. It's not like, has anybody used perforce? not like perforce where it's like a, a change list, right? You can't delete one of these lines and it doesn't put it in the commit anymore. You can't do stuff like that. I've seen people try to do that. Um, it just is for your edification. This is what your commit is, has touched. Um, if you do git commit dash v, it'll put the diff in here as well. So you can actually see and strip the diff out of the commit message. So you can see what the exact change is. So you can write a really nice commit message for it. Um, if you forgot, to, it'll put in like, you forgot to add these files or something, right? Then, and you want to get out and just do an empty message, get add them, and then run the committee in. Okay, so then you get some output like this. And basically the way that it does this is it says, the snapshot you just recorded to the database versus the snapshot that you based that change on, the one that was checked out in your working directory when you started working, this is what's different between them, right? It just goes through the two snapshots and basically runs a diff and says, there are two files that are different between the two of them, four insertions and two deletions between them, if I were to run a diff on, the, on those two snapshots. Right? So it figures it out after the fact. OK, so basic workflow. You add files, you stage changes with git add, uh, you review your changes with git status, and you commit the changes with git commit. And that's the basic workflow. Now, the basic workflow is that you can just edit the files and then run git commit a. And git commit a will run commit or git in sort of a subversion style. It'll look, it will run git add on every file that was in your last commit, right? So that's how it determines track. It, it, it's not really track in the sense of I have a rev log named that somewhere, like it is in subversion or something. Track in git just means in the one that I checked out in your working directory was this file there. Right? If you added it and committed it and then removed it, then it's not tracked anymore. It, it doesn't know that it was in your history at all. It doesn't care. Right? Because it's just whatever the last file this thing is. Um, so anyways, it will get commit dash it will act like subversion. It just automatically stages everything and commits them and uh, it does it all in one step. So that's how you can do it. It will also ignore untracked files. And, and OK, so any questions with that? OK, so, yeah? Um, um, the staging area you mentioned, can you use that function? Is it, is it a, a direct, is it a tree of your main project? So I mean, if you've got the staging area, would you be able to run against that? So to verify the, the benefit of the staging area, is that a, a usable tree which you can access on the test? Um, no, it's a file. It's a binary file that is basically just a flat manifest. It says, here are all of the files in your project and all the checksums of when you check them out and what they're staged at. So it can tell you what the, if there are any of them are different. Um, so it, there's no real, there, there's a, a, a program called git ls tree, which has a bunch of flags and you can use it to look at your index and see, you know, in a programmatic fashion and see what has changed or, you know, what is staged or whatnot. Yeah. But you can, if you want to check what the stage stuff looks like in order to test it, for example, before you can do the big stash event X to determine the working point. What the index looks like. Oh, get stash? Get stash? Yeah. Dash dash index? Yeah. Well, stash all the uh, unstaged changes. Oh, right. But not the stage changes, so that your working directory looks exactly like an index. Yes, that's a good way to do it. If you want, if you want to get your working directory to look exactly like your index, you you can run. There's actually a number of things that you can do. You can do a temporary commit and uh, you know switch to a branch and reset to. to I mean, the, the, there's a number of things that you can do. Um, the, that's probably the easiest one. Uh, we haven't gotten to get stash, and I'm actually not even really going to cover it. Um, but get stash will will take everything that's unmodified in your working directory. 
um, and do like a temporary commit in a different namespace so that you don't really have to worry about it and put you back to where you were. If you do dash dash deep index, it'll do whatever your index was. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there's programmatic access to it. There's um, uh, you can also have several indexes if, if you want to. I mean, it gets really confusing and kind of difficult to do, but you can set an environment variable that says, here's my index, and have temporary indexes and things like that. Um, anyways, that's a little bit outside the scope, but did, did, did that cover the question at all? I don't even remember. Now I'm just rambling. Okay. Um, so, in the background, what's going on when you're, when you're running the, these commands, right? When you do your ads and your commits and stuff. So, this is this, the, um, the checksum, right? This is the checksum of the commit that you just did. Um, so, this is basically your version number. It is the first couple of characters of a 40 character uh, SHA-1 hash. Is anybody not familiar? Is anybody familiar with SHA-1 or MD5? Okay, so SHA-1 is a checksum like MD5, so you give it, you, you give the algorithm any amount, any content at all, and it will give you back 20 bytes, right? And if you want to actually look at them in a human readable format, it, it takes up 40 hex characters. Um, so you get a 40 hex character thing like this. If you have some huge piece of content, it will SHA to something, and then you change one bit in it, and it will SHA to something completely randomly different, right? They're, they're not, they will not be similar at all, or they shouldn't be. Um, they won't be, don't worry about it. Um, so it's, it's very randomized, and everything in Git is sort of a key value, it's sort of really a key value store, right? You give it any piece of content, it will SHA it, store the, con store the content, and then give you the SHA back, and say, if you ever want this content again, just ask me for this SHA, right? And so you take that SHA as a key, and you say git, I want whatever that is, and it will give you th that content back, whatever it happens to be, right? So everything in git is stored in this manner. And it's stored in this manner because there's no version numbers. There's no centralized authority that can give you monotonically increasing version numbers that says 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So instead, it just SHA, it doesn't even try. It just SHAs everything, gives you checksums that will not collide. And you can create your own, and somebody else can create your own. You can slap the databases together, and you won't have any overlap, right? So, so you can just rate, you can just add everybody's objects to your database, and with pointers to where their stuff is, and, every, and there, there won't be any problems with combining those databases. It's very simple to do. So, if you ask it in this case for the SHA, for even you can give it the first couple characters, you can give it the full forty, it will give you back content, and in this case, it's a commit object, right? So the content will look like this. This is actually what Git SHAs. There's a little header on the beginning uh, that, that will modify the SHA a little bit, but it's very easy to recreate the SHA uh, output if you want to. You just take these bytes and add a little header and SHA it, and you'll get that 770 d 3 whatever. But this is, this is the raw data of what a commit object looks like with the metadata. Author, committer, commit message, uh, tree, and possibly some parents. So, what are those things? If you look at the tree, if you say, was there a question? No. If you look at the tree and you say, git, what is that? So, you asked it what 773 was, it gives you this commit data. You say, okay, what is C4 EC5? It will give you a tree, a directory listing. It says, here's some content, and here are what the file names are, and the modes and stuff. And if you say, okay, well, what is 3D5, whatever, then that'll give you the content of what app.yaml was as of that thing, right? So you can keep asking it for these shells, and it'll keep giving you content back out. Um, and then if you ask it for a parent, if there is a parent, you can say, what is the parent? And it will give you another commit object, which itself has a tree and a parent, and so on and so forth, right? So every time you're running a commit, it's just adding to this chain. It's putting a new one on that says, this is the parent, because that's where I started. That was what was in my working directory when I started. I made some changes. I created a new snapshot. Here's the new commit and snapshot and all the content associated with it. And, uh, and so this is what it gets doing, is it's building up this, this directed graph of snapshots of your project, right? Now, it will take all of this stuff, all of these, these pieces of content, and it puts it in its, in its git directory, in docket slash objects, you'll have all these, all these objects in there, randomized. Um, and if you say git checkout branch, when you're actually checking out some branch, um, or when you do a clone and does some initial checkout. It will take whatever the, the last commit on that branch is, 